Hi class, welcome to the first video for our Calculus 1 sequence. Um, this is the set of lecture videos that goes with the um, first book that I actually published under the OER uh, Common Share License. <clears throat> so um, just a quick overview. Um, chapter 1 is really just all review. Okay, so we're really just going to go over a lot of uh, pre-calculus material. Um, if you took a pre-calculus class with me or somewhere else, then that material is, is really similar. Um, a lot of the material that we're going to go over in this chapter, for the most part, except for the later sections, is a lot of literally like word for word the same material that I use for my uh, pre-calculus sequence. So if you um, have already watched my pre-calculus video sequence or you took my class, a lot of this stuff might look familiar to you. There is some stuff in here that is new. Um, new in the sense that there are a different set of problems or a different approach to things, but a lot of the stuff that we're going to go through from chapter in chapter one, at least, um, you know, pretty much all of chapter one is something that is in my pre calculus sequence already or my pre calculus course reader. So, um, if you've already taken that class, then this will be a breeze for you, um, really just a refresher, right? So, what I like to tell students is that calculus is based off of is built on top of algebra the way that algebra is built on top of arithmetic, right? So a good example is that if you think about what, um, what an exponent is, right? An exponent is just a bunch of multiplication, right? X times X times X times X times X is X to the fourth or X to the fifth or what have you, right? And if we have X plus X plus X plus X plus X, right? that's the same thing as 5 times x, right? So we know that from algebra, but that idea is based off of just regular arithmetic, multiplication and addition. So the way that algebra is just based off of arithmetic, calculus in a similar form is just built off of algebra, right? So you're using algebraic ideas to build these calculus sort of ideas. So the stronger your algebra is, the easier calculus is going to be for you. So that's why we're going over review of functions because really all we're really focusing on in calculus one for the most part are different functions, right? And then we're just doing a bunch of stuff to them. So it's very important that we understand how functions work, what a function actually is, how to read a function from a graph, understanding all the different representations that we can have for a function. So that's why uh, chapter one is really just an overview of pre-calculus, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. So what is a function? Function is basically a rule that is going to take an input and assign to that input an output, right? So a lot of times you hear about this black box where something goes in, some stuff happens, and you get something out. Very, very similar to that. Um, there are very specific, one very specific rule for a function, which is that um, every input has to go to its own output, right? That's the, really the only rule for a function. If that rule does not work, right? If that rule is not abided by, you no longer have a function and you just have a relationship or a relation. So I always tell students, think about a vending machine, right? If I put in a dollar and I press the button for a root beer, I should get a root beer out. And every single time I press root beer, I will get out a root beer because that input gives me out that input. Now, if I press root beer and I get out a root beer, and then I press root beer and I get out a sprite and then I press root beer and I get out a milkshake, right? Something random. That's no longer a function because that one button I'm pressing is giving me out all kinds of different things. So a function abides by the rule that whenever you give in an input, a very specific output is received. Okay. So our inputs we generally refer to as X. That is not always the case. Um, but that's the easiest standard that we abide by is that it is X and the output is F of X. Okay. So the benefits of using this F of X notation is that it's very easy to understand what's going in and what's coming out. The thing inside of this notation is what is the input, right? The whole thing itself, F of X is the output. So it's very easy to say, Oh, the thing inside is what I'm plugging in. And then this whole, thing whatever it equals to that is my output right so again the input is 
inside of the notation. X is inside of these parentheses. And the output is going to be on the outside, right? So F of something inside gives me something out, okay? So let's do an example. Let's take a very simple linear uh, function, 2x minus 5. If I plug in x equals 1 as an input, everywhere I see x, I replace with the value of 1. So not f of x anymore because x equals 1, so I replace x with 1. f of 1 means, again, everywhere I see x, I plug in 1, okay? So I get 2 minus 5, which is negative 3. Okay, and I, I know you're probably like, dang, Professor Williams, this is going super slow. It's okay. We'll build up momentum. We've got to start somewhere, right? So our notation here would be f of 1 is negative 3. That's the notation for this input into this function. Now, let's say I plug in something not so standard like a. Okay, a is another variable, but we call this a fixed variable. variable okay, so if I plug in a fixed variable of a, then everywhere I see x, I do the same thing, and I just plug in a, okay? If I plug in a minus 3, that's that same fixed value, but 3 less than it. Well, everywhere I see x, I plug in a minus 3. And so then I plug that into my function 2 times a minus 3. Make sure you're using parentheses. As you notice, I'm using parentheses on both previous examples because it indicates to the reader, generally me, who's grading your stuff, right? that that's what you're plugging in. It's also important because when you plug in something weird, like a minus 3, the parentheses allow you to understand that everything in here is being doubled, right? Because if I just wrote it as 2, a minus 3 minus 5, it's highly possible that you forget that this 2 needs to distribute to both terms, and then you end up with 2a minus 3 minus 5, which is not the same as what we would have here, right here, we'd have 2a minus 11. If I did not use parentheses, I would have 2a minus 8, right, which is not the same thing here. So that's why using parentheses, especially when you're plugging something in, is extremely important. Just get into the habit. It will keep you from having minor mistakes that cost you greatly later on, right? So again, if I'm plugging in a minus 3, I'm going to have an output of 2a minus 11. The collection of all the things that I'm allowed to plug in to my function, all of the possible inputs, is called the domain. All of the things that I'm allowed to get out is called the range, right? So all if I plugged every single thing into my function, all the things that I get out is the range. All the things I plugged in would be the domain. Okay. So there's four ways to represent a function. Okay, so our four ways to represent a function is verbally with words, right? Similar to how I just described um, the situation with the vending machine. Uh, algebraically with function notation, which is the example that we just saw a second ago. Visually with the graph and numerically with the table of values. Now we will talk about all four of these methods for this course. Um, verbally with words would be more of like a classroom thing when I'm giving anecdotal examples like the vending machine. That's when you'll hear that in this course. Um, algebraically with function notation, that's going to be the number one. That's what we're going to use the most. Visually with the graph will be a close second. So generally in algebra, we focus only on like the arithmetic and the math and things like that. There are graphs, but it's generally like, how do I graph this? What does this graph look like? We're going to be focusing a lot on graphs in this class, right? That's one of the main differences between like a calculus and pre-calculus is that graphs are a huge focus on what we're doing, right? So it's getting it started into this visualization of what it is that we're working with, okay? Uh, numerically with the table of values, we will be doing that quite a bit as well, but not as much as the other two. So algebraically is definitely number one. Visually is a close second. Numerically with the table of values, we do that when we're trying to really, really kind of uh, tiptoe through a topic before we get to the algebraic method of what it is that we're going to do. So we do see quite a bit of tables, um, but again, these middle two are the top that we're going to see a lot. So let's do an example, okay? So let's consider a function, right? The reciprocal function, 1 over x. So whatever my input is, my output is the reciprocal of that. So if I plug in 5, 
my output is 1 over 5, right? So the domain of this is all real numbers except what makes the denominator 0, right? We always talk about that, especially in uh, pre-calculus and algebra, right? We're not allowed to have 0 on the bottom. I cannot divide something into 0 pieces because I have, at minimum, the one of those, right? So, there, you know, that's the minimum number of things I can have is one of those things. So uh, when I divide things in pieces, uh, I cannot divide by zero. So I do like to use interval notation and set builder notation. So the domain here, D, is all real numbers such that X is not equal to zero. Okay, so I can plug in anything that's a real value as long as it's not zero. The range of this function is all real numbers except 0. I can never make this function equal to 0. No matter what I plug in in the denominator, I will never get 0 out, okay? Because I always have something that I'm dividing into pieces. So there's always pieces of something, okay? So verbally, I can say that the output is equal to the reciprocal of the input, which is actually what I just said when I first uh, demonstrated this slide a second ago, right? The graph of this function looks like this, okay? So hopefully this is not the first time you've ever seen this graph, but this is the way it works. So when I plug in very, very small values, I actually get very large outputs, right? So if I plug in 1 divided by 1 half, for instance, the output is actually 2, right? So plugging in small things makes this very large. Plugging in large things makes this very small, right? One over a thousand is one, one thousand, very small values. And so when I plug in negative values, it does the same thing, but opposite, right? So if I plug in very small negative values, I get very large negative values out, right? Extremely large values, but negative. And when I plug in very large negative numbers, like negative one million, I get very, very small values that are close to zero but still negative. So to talk about this just a little bit in terms of like how we think about this in calculus, for instance, notice that the long-term behavior here is zero, right? As I plug in very large values in this direction, I get smaller and smaller, I get closer to zero. When I plug in very large negative numbers, I also have an end behavior that tends towards zero. I have a vertical asymptote here, right? As I get closer to zero, for my inputs, my function goes either towards infinity or towards negative infinity, right? Here we say the horizontal asymptote is zero because on both ends in the long run, I go towards zero. Notice there's no max value, right? It goes on larger and larger and larger forever. There is no minimum value, right? Um, from zero to infinity, my function is decreasing in value. Right? I start large and I end up small. I am also decreasing in value over the interval from negative infinity to zero. Okay, So I have to break this up into two intervals because I have a break here. I have a value that I'm not allowed to plug in, which is zero. So I'm decreasing here and I'm decreasing here. So overall, my function is decreasing, Okay, even though I jump from very, very negative values to very, very, very large positive values. I'm still decreasing overall, but I am not um, monotonally decreasing, right? It's not monic. It's not always decreasing because there is a jump from being negative to very positive, right? So I would say over this interval, I'm decreasing, and over this interval, I'm decreasing, but I would not say from negative infinity to infinity, it's a decreasing function because there is a break here where it jumps from small to large okay so as an overview that's kind of how we think about things in calculus what are my largest values do i have any like localized largest values um what's my end behavior what's happening as i go on to infinity or to negative infinity um do i have any vertical asymptotes do i have any slant asymptotes what's happening around the, those asymptotes is there any point where i'm not continuous right meaning in order for me to draw my graph, do I have to lift my pencil off the paper? And I do, right? There's kind of one half and another half, and I cannot draw that all 
with not taking my pencil off. So this is a discontinuous function. So these are all kind of things that we think about when it comes to calculus. And of course, we actually analyze it in a much greater detail than that. But overall, those are the things that we're interested in, right? And yes, we can tell from looking at the graph what's happening. But really, the goal is to be able to say, hey, this is my function. Okay, this is my function. What's happening without even looking at the graph? What's the end behavior? Are there any asymptotes? What's happening at the asymptotes? Are there any localized max and min values? What's the largest value I can have? What's the smallest value I can have? These are all things that I would like to be able to answer just by looking at my function and not having to consider graphing this out and then looking at the graph. Okay, so let's look at this as well as a table of values, right? So if I just, again, for a table of values, I kind of have to pick an area of concern generally that's around zero, right? Because that's generally when the cool stuff happens. Um, as you go out to very large values or you're coming from very large values, generally things just kind of have their own little pattern. But uh, around asymptotes and, and holes and things like that, that's when I'm concerned with what is my function doing. So we're going to start at negative four. The function's a reciprocal function, so I just flip it over, right? I'm getting closer and closer to zero. <laughs> Okay, and at zero, I'm actually undefined. And then as I move away from zero, it really does the same thing. So I'm going to start. So you see, I got very, very, very close to zero. And then here I'm moving away from zero, but I'm starting very, very close. I'm trying to give you guys an idea of what happens um, as we move away. Okay, so I'm very close to zero. I get something large at one. The reciprocal of one is one. And as I'm very far away, I get something very small. Right, so from a table of values, we can say, okay, I can kind of see what's happening here. Um, obviously, looking at a graph, you get, you know, as visual creatures, it's a lot easier to be like, oh, okay, that's what's happening. Um, but we should be able to identify what's happening from a table of values as well. Okay. So now let's talk about the vertical line test. The vertical line test is a test that we have to determine if something is a function or not. Okay. So remember what I said at the beginning about our vending machine? If I press a button, I should always get the same thing out, right? So every input has its own output. An input should not have more than one different output, okay? So the vertical line test is a test that we have for a graph to determine whether or not we have more than one input. So here you can see that if I draw a vertical line anywhere kind of over here, right, I'm going to hit my function more than once. That means that for this input point here, I have an output here, and I have an output here, right? There are two different outputs for one input, which means that this small example here is not a function, okay? And so then that leads us to reading a graph, right? So having a graph is nice, being able to look at it and tell what's happening at the ends and asymptotes and all this kind of stuff, when, it's in, when is it increasing and decreasing? But if we don't know how to like read a very specific value, then we're going to have a really, really hard time in this class. So this is definitely something you guys should be familiar with already. We're going to do this a lot. Uh, but you know, when we look at a point on a graph, we're looking at it as an input and an output or as an XY pair. Okay. So uh, again, generally use XY, but now we have that Y is equal to F of X. So we typically refer to it as X and its function, right? It's function uh, output in the notation. So here we have our graph. Uh, if this is my input of A, just some value, right? That's why we call it a fixed variable because it's some value. It doesn't necessarily have to be three in this case. Um, maybe I'm counting by threes and this is actually nine. Maybe I'm counting by hundreds and this is actually 300, right? Maybe I'm counting by 15 and this is actually 45. So it's just some value on my graph. So generally when we're talking about things in a generalized fashion, a is just some variable, right? Or just some value um, that I'm interested in. So I go to a value of A, okay, that's my input. I go up until I hit my function or down until I hit my function. And then the value of this, as I trace it back to the Y axis is my function output, okay? So I call this A, F of A. So that if this was three, if it was three, it would be three and F of three. This is 45, then that's 45 and f of 45, which is 
whatever it is I get out when I plug in 45 to my function. So if I had an actual function, I would put that output, right? Since I don't have a function, I read it as f of a, that fixed variable that I have, okay? So this is the value of f of a. So I trace that back to the y-axis, and whatever number, whatever value I get here, that's my output. So my outputs are here, my inputs are here, right? So I go up and down along here to look at my inputs, right? And then when I hit my function, I trace back to the left and right, right, depending on what time I'm on, to see what my outputs are. Okay. So one of the things I would talk about a lot in pre-calculus is transformations of a function. What this does is allow us to look at a function in terms of what's called a parent function, just moved around or stretched in some way. This is very, very, very useful when we get into calculus because our parent functions, which we'll talk about in the next video, are really easy, right? They're the basic functions that we know, right? Y equals X, um, two to the X, uh, absolute value of X, really basic, basic functions. And we just move those things around. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, the first one. So when we talk about transformations, I like I like to talk about it in terms of an outside shift and an inside shift. Um, an outside shift is what happens when we're applying transformation directly to the output of our function. It generally works in exactly the same way that we would think it would work, right? So for instance, if I want to um, shift my function up by five, I'm taking all the outputs and I'm moving them up by five. So if I'm just adding five to my function, all the output values are increasing by five, right? So it works exactly the way I would think. On the outside, when I'm uh, applying transformations directly to the f of x notation, I'm doing exactly what I want. When I'm applying shifts to the inside of my transformation, okay, which I like to call an inside shift, things actually work the opposite way. If you apply shift on the inside though, it, it, it works opposite, right? So if I want to move my inputs to the left or my inputs to the right, I'm actually plugging in uh, what looks like the opposite value of what I want it to move. So if I want it, uh, if I want it to move to the right <clears throat> by like three units, I'm actually going to have my x values minus three. Okay, that's what it's going to look like when I plug it in. So transformations on the inside work a little bit differently, right? So like if I want to stretch things or compress things, you would think that if I had two times X, that means that everything would be stretched out by two. But actually what it does is it shrinks it and compresses it by a factor of two, the opposite of what we would think would happen. Okay, so outside shifts affect things vertically to our transformation right directly to the outputs the inside shifts affect horizontal transformations things that happen on the inside the inputs of our function okay so let's start with the vertical translation which i anecdotally verbally relate to just a second ago <clears throat> okay so we can translate a, a function up or down by adding a constant okay the constants for the vertical transformation the translation we'll call k so what that looks like is my new function is going to be my old function plus some number. Okay. If k is positive, it moves up. If k is negative, it moves down, just like we would expect it to do. Okay. For horizontal translation, we'll also call my new function g. Okay. So here what we're doing is we're trying to move our function left or right. So I use minus h. Okay. So if my h if I want to move three units to the right, I plug in three here. So this will actually look like X minus three, which most students, when they see it, think, oh, I got to move to the left because I see this negative, right? Negative is in the left direction, but that's actually the opposite, right? So if I see X minus three, it means I take my whole function and I move it to the right, to the positive direction, even though we see a negative value inside of our notation, right? And that's, again, because it's an inside shift. It happens inside the function notation. So it works in the opposite manner of what we would expect to see. Okay. Next, we have reflections. So reflections play a very, very, very important role in calculus, especially when we're trying to look at our functions and what it is that they're doing. Um, a lot of times, understanding the symmetry based on reflection 
makes the math a lot, a lot easier, especially, especially so once we get to calculus two. Reflections and symmetry will play a huge role in our work. Okay, so if my new function is the negative of f of x, well, that means I'm taking all of my outputs and I'm making them negative. Okay, so if something was positive, it's now negative, which means that my function is flipped across the x-axis, right? So it flips it across the x-axis. If I have a negative on the inside of my function, that means that instead of plugging in f, uh, instead of plugging in x equals 5, I would be plugging in x equals negative 5 on the opposite side of the y-axis. So a shift on the inside is a reflection across the y-axis. So next we come to the vertical compression and expansion. This is the last type of transformation that we deal with. Okay, so if it's vertical, that means it's happening on the outside directly to our transformation, right? So just like this, this is a vertical, right? It flips it across the x-axis, which is a vertical, right? The things on top now become the things on the bottom. This is inside, it's a horizontal reflection. The things that were on the left side are now on the right side and vice versa. Okay. For a vertical compression, again, this is applying directly to the output of the function. So if I'm multiplying it by a, that means all of my outputs are larger by a factor of a, right? If this is two f of x, everything is twice as large. This is one half f of x, everything is half of the size, right? So it's exactly what I would think it to be. We call a the amplitude of the function. It's adjusting all of the heights, the entire height of the function. Okay. Um, so yes, so when a is larger than one, we're increasing in value when it's an expansion, right? And if a is in between zero and one, then we're shrinking. If a is negative, then we're going to reflect. And if it's negative and larger than one, right, like negative five, we're going to reflect across the x-axis and grow that amplitude as well, okay? So, for horizontal compression expansion, it's gonna be the same thing, but we're gonna multiply on the inside of, a, of our function directly to x, and it's gonna work in the opposite way. So if a is a large value, okay, which in this case we'll call it lambda, if lambda is large, that's not gonna expand my function it's actually going to shrink it and compress it down. Because remember, horizontal inside uh, compressions, right? Inside transformations do the opposite of what we had expected to, right? So if this is a large value, it does not stretch it out long ways. It compresses it like an accordion to be short, okay? Everything happens quickly, right? So when lambda is larger than one, we compress horizontally okay and when lambda is small that's when we expand horizontally right so I know I haven't given you guys any like examples yet because um, again we go through all of this in in uh, pre-calculus you can look at my course reader there for lots and lots of examples I also have videos if you need to kind of refresh yourself on the transformations it's chapter 2 um, in my pre-calculus section uh, but these ideas, the ideas of what's happening is what you really need to be able to hold on to, okay? So we can combine all these transformations all at once, right? And the order in which we apply the transformations matter, right? We want to apply the transformations in agreement with PEMDAS or GAMDAS or whatever method it is that you learn, right? But all of my transformations, in not in order, but all together, I have my amplitude, I have my horizontal compression and expansion, I have my left and right transformation, and I have my up and down vertical transformation, right, translation. So the way, the order that we apply these would be the same as the order of operations if it was directly on x. So for instance, if f of x was x squared, and we wanted to apply all of these transformations, we would apply them in the same order that we would if we applied all of these things to x squared. Right, so meaning that uh, whatever is closest with the function first, so or the input, right, whatever it is that's happening. So you apply the inside uh, 
translation and then you would apply the compression right because PEMDAS right so this is a parentheses and then multiplication and then you would do the next uh, multiplication and addition right so you go from the inside out inside out okay so again this is not the same okay, let's look at this notation so this a times my function with the shifts being applied in this order is not the same as if I have lambda times x and then minus h. So here I would apply the lambda first and then the horizontal translation. Here I'm applying the horizontal translation and then that horizontal compression expansion. Okay. So these would not give me the same thing. We should be clear just even from this notation point, right? If I distribute this lambda across, it's not the same as this, right? So the order in which I apply them matters. Sometimes you'll see it like this, depending on the textbook, and sometimes you'll see it in this form. But here, I'm going to get one function I call g of x, which is not equal to this form, which would be a completely different function, which I would call q of x, right? So let's do an example, okay? So if I have all of these translations going on, right, these transformations, this is just the graph of square root of x, right? So the parent graph is square root of x, which is, has all these transformations in it. So the first thing that I would do is I would translate this function to the left, right? Because it's plus three. Remember, horizontal shifts work in the opposite way. So this is minus a minus three. So the translation is in the negative direction. So first I translate left three units, then I apply the compression. And again, this inside shift right here, this uh, compression expansion of two does not mean I'm stretching it out by two. It means everything happens at twice the speed, which means it happens faster, right? So what I like to tell students is if I watch a movie on that's an hour long and I watch it on two times fast forward, then it's done in half an hour, right? So what happens is everything happens twice as fast. So that's how you should think of the trans, the inside transformations, right? So if I watch it on half speed, one half here, if this was a one half, it would take two hours to watch that movie instead of one hour. So you can kind of think about it like this. The inside translation lambda here is just kind of like, am I watching on double speed, half speed, three times as fast, quarter speed, like what's going on? So the next transformation is that I'm compressing it horizontally by a factor of two. Everything is happening twice as fast, okay? Next is I am going to do the vertical compression. This, uh, everything is half as large. And then lastly, I apply moving everything down by four units, okay? If I went in a different order, right? The order here is that I'm not applying this plus three first, right? Like I would in PEMDAS. Here, the first thing that's happening to my input is two. So I'm compressing first by a factor of two. Then I'm translating to the left by three. And then my vertical gets cut down by one half. And then I shift down by one half. And it's very clear that these are two different functions, right? In order for this, sorry, in order for H and G to be the same, um, in the same format, I should say, I would have 2x plus 6, not 2x plus 3. Okay, So there's a slight difference, but the outputs will be different. right? So next, let's talk about the algebra function. So we've talked a lot about functions so far. We've talked about uh, domain, range. We've, in an impromptu manner, talked about increase, decrease, uh, max and mins, right, kind of deals. Um, impromptu, right? We've also talked about asymptotes, vertical and horizontal, which we'll get into a lot later on. Don't, you know, I know I kind of breeze over it, but we spend a lot of time talking about that stuff. Um, we talked about transformations, right? We've talked about reflections and horizontal, vertical uh, movements and compressions. And we've talked about, you know, inputs and outputs. When is a function a function? The vertical line test. Now let's talk about all the different things we can do with functions also, right? So we can add functions together. We can divide them, multiply them. Anything we can do with numbers, for the most part, we can also do with functions. So um, a function is going to have a domain of A. If I have a second function, it's going to have a different domain. 
possibly the same. So I'll differentiate the domains by domain of A for F and the domain of B for G. Okay. So when I combine functions algebraically by adding them, subtracting them, multiplying or whatever, I make a new function. Okay. And my new function will have a domain that is the intersection of the two previous functions. So if F have a domain of A and G has a domain of B, if I add those two things together, then whatever the overlap of those two functions is going to be the domain of my new function. Okay. So uh, first thing I can do is I can add two functions together. So you can either do that by looking at just their notations. I'm adding F and G or I'm subtracting them. It's the same thing as if I take the whole function and add them or subtract them together, right? So there's two different ways for the, that notation, okay? The, the, there's a slight difference here, um, but they're equal, so we don't really worry about that, okay? I can multiply two functions together to create a new function, right? Uh, I can divide two functions to create a new function. Here, the only restriction is that g cannot be 0, right? So we're not allowed to have zeros in the denominator. Um, and that's pretty much everything. Okay, as far as like the algebra function. So adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Dividing is really just multiplication anyways. So two and three, kind of the same thing. Composition of functions is when you take one function and you plug it into another. Or you take a function and plug it into itself, right? So uh, here we, the notation is f of g. The first, I'm um, sorry, the last function you see gets plugged into the first one. I always think about it as the function that's closest to x is what you start with. And that goes into the next function, right? So you're, you're kind of looking at it as the one closest to x is first. And you take that function and you plug it into the next one. And if you have more and more and more, you just keep doing that, OK? So I can compose multiple functions together, right, just like this. So here I would start with h. I would plug that into g. And whatever I get for that, I would then plug into so f of g of h of x is h of x being plugged into g composed with f or just h inside of g inside of f. And again, I can do this literally forever, right? So um, it's important to understand how to do this, you know, with our actual functions, our algebraic form of the functions, also with the graphs and also with uh, tables. So we'll go over, you know, a really brief example. But if you want to get deeper into this, again, go look at my pre-cal section. This is really meant for a review, just so that you can remember all the stuff that we're allowed to do. And then, you know, as we go through chapter one, we're going to look at each function individually. So right now we're just talking about functions as a whole. Then we're going to move into polynomials and trig functions and exponentials. And each of those are going to get their own section. Right. So right now we're just looking at functions as a whole. So again, if you want to kind of review some of these materials, um, independently, you know, I urge you to go and either look at the course reader that I have for pre-calculus or just go and watch whatever uh, video goes along with this section. I have a whole video on composition of functions, so we're not going to spend an entire video on it. Just like you've seen, we're really just kind of doing a brief overview of what's happening, right? So the way that this works for a composition of functions is I have a domain for some function. Um, and I can go from x to the land of g by the function g. And then I can go into the land of f by a function f. So I can go from x to g of x and then plug g of x into f and get f of g of x. Or composition of functions allows me to do that with one singular function. I can plus, I can plug x into the composition of f and g and get there directly. So that's uh, visually kind of what's happening, right? So this is a domain. This is the range for g. And this is the range for f. So if I want to, I can go from x to g. Or if I want to get from x into f, I have to go into that composition of functions.